my own state has one of the most conservative approaches to gay rights issues in the world. I mean, they're closer to third world dictatorships than they are to civilized countries. Well, it's always good to be an anthropologist because you can do anthropology anywhere. And actually, Oklahoma is a fairly fascinating part of the United States. We Oklahomans, nowadays I can call myself at least a transplant Oklahomans, know that the rest of the country looks down on us, right? I mean, I grew up in California. The worst thing you could be called on the playground was Oki. Whether you look at our geography, some say we're in the Midwest, some say we're in the South, the Southwest. No, look at the culture and you realize very quickly we're a southern city with the same problems of other southern cities in terms of race and struggle over civil rights. I didn't know that there were still places, or if there were places, where one race lived on one side of town and one race lived on the other. I believe some of the most prejudiced people in the world are the people that are trying to find somebody that they're better than. Uh, I think that and I had to use the term white trash or some of the, the worst people about being prejudiced. But they're just trying to find somebody that they can say, because I'm straight or because I'm white, I'm better, I'm good. People just had that look, and, I, and it's a look of smell shit, can't find it. You know, they're always looking down at people. They're always looking at people with disgust. Bitches! You know, stab them in the back and be slop sugar, as my grandma would say, the slop sugar all over them. You know? <laughs> Oklahomans are interesting about the way they discriminate. Because I live as an openly gay person. My boyfriend and I will go out to eat. We are affectionate in public, and no one is ever rude. The discrimination here is not, in my experience, although other people have had other experiences, but in my experience, has not been overt and direct and personal. It's structural. It's institutional. Conservatives are very vocal, and they've convinced the state that they're conservative. If you were out in the, in, in the boonies, your contact was bad television or the daily newspaper. And if the daily newspaper is the same line over and over again, they're not rejecting liberalism. It's just not there. So this is the way it is. So I found the people here to be very conservative, but not as many conservative as people want people to believe there are. There are a lot of people who make the assumption in Oklahoma that everybody's straight, everybody's married, everybody's an evangelical Christian, everybody's a Republican, everybody is married and has children. And if you challenge any one of those precepts, they have a hard time figuring out what to do with you. I don't care what my neighbor's doing in their bed. Uh, it frankly doesn't interest me. And I have never been able to figure out what the obsession with that is. At this point, the only option is to leave here. Uh, if you really want to experience being free and open and getting to express who you are. Unfortunately, Oklahoma will probably be the last bastion of intolerance in this country. I have more rights in South Africa, which was a racist dictatorship when I was in high school. I have full equality in Spain, which when I was born was still governed by its 1930s era fascist dictator. But my own state has one of the most conservative approaches to gay rights issues in the world. I mean, they're closer to third world dictatorships than they are to civilized countries. Fine, 
But we need to ask you why, dear Oklahoma. Dear Oklahoma, you made me who I am. I am your daughter, help me understand. Pray beneath the same blue skies, watch tornadoes pass us by. Can't you love me? If I love her, dear Oklahoma. I met my love teaching school, passing on what's right and true. Led by example, and we taught the golden rule. We're told we don't belong, and that how we love is wrong. We're staying put to sing this song, dear Oklahoma, dear Oklahoma. You made me who I am. I am your daughter. Help me understand. Pray beneath the same blue skies. Watch tornado. Pass us by. Can't you love me? If I love her, dear Oklahoma. Now we're leaving Tulsa town. To exchange our wedding vows and home again to work the fields that we have plowed, and we're holding out our hands 'cause in our hearts we love this land. Was it so hard to love us back, dear Oklahoma? Dear Oklahoma, you made me who I am. I am your. Beneath the same blue skies, watch tornadoes pass us by. Can't you love me? Can't you love me? If I love her, dear Oklahoma. This church is a United Church of Christ. Fellowship Congregational Church was established here in Tulsa in 1949. And the issue that created this church was the issue of racism. The minister of that time was a Presbyterian pastor, Jackson Smith, who felt that the doors of the church have to be open to everyone or else we're not truly a church. So think about this, Deep South, 1949, the buckle of the Bible belt, and here he was saying that our church has to welcome African Americans. And it created such a controversy that he could no longer be a Presbyterian minister. And so he, along with 300 others, founded Fellowship Congregational Church, which is part of this denomination, the United Church of Christ, that traces its history all the way back to the pilgrim fathers and mothers who landed at Plymouth Rock and is known predominantly today as being the most progressive Christian denomination in the United States. There are about 6,000 churches and 1,400,000 members nationwide. The United Church of Christ, um, in terms of being open and affirming, is the language we use to say that the doors of our church are open to anyone. And that would include gay and lesbian people, but not simply that the doors are open, but that we affirm they are children of God. We're also working on issues of racism that haven't been addressed. One of the things that is the darkest chapter in Tulsa history are the race riots of 1921. People don't want to talk about it, but it's something that is still in need of healing generations later. It's a part of the fabric of this city and its people. 
for example, since 1969 or 70, there was a pairing of churches, predominantly black churches in North Tulsa with uh, predominantly white churches in the rest of Tulsa. And we have exchanges where we have dinners together and get to know each other and share our greetings. That has been impossible the past three years because the church we're paired with in North Tulsa had a pastor who wasn't accepting of the fact that the United Church of Christ is accepting gays and lesbians. So even this issue came to impede uh, a beautiful relationship that had been established for generations. And that's a struggle because we've tried everything. I mean, uh, we call, we invite, we ask, and, and just get no response. I had one church member who's an African-American in Connecticut. And I said, what's the difference in the North and the South? Here's what he said. He said, I've worked here for 45 years in Connecticut in the post office, and there's some people I see every week, and I don't know if they like me or dislike me. He said, in the South, in about 4.5 minutes, I can figure out if a person likes me or dislikes me. What does it mean to be loving as a Christian? And if you say you're loving, but then as a church preach judgment, condemnation, rejection, and even subtly hatred as many fundamentalist churches do, how do they do that in the name of, of love? And the answer is human nature and prejudice has always been present within human beings. What's wrong with First John 4, 8, God is love? What's wrong with quoting Bible verses where Jesus speaks of love and inclusion? Why is that banned? I mean, Leviticus? I mean, if you want to quote Leviticus, do you want to quote the passages about slavery? Do you want to quote the passages about polygamy? Do you want to quote passages that obviously socially we've moved past? In Leviticus it says you should stone a child for disobedience. Now come on. Would you have survived teenage years? <laughs> Would you have survived teenage years? Come on now. Uh, so they want to take verses here and there and create a whole philosophy of hate. When the overall subject of the book is what? God's love for creation, for animals, for people, and for life. So what we consider love for, I think, progressive Christians is something that's constantly we're seeking to expand and to examine personal prejudices and to work beyond that. If you're a teenager and you're going through a deep crisis of identity and you're contemplating suicide, please, please find your community. Find the people who will love you and accept you as a child of God. Don't be out there alone. The most brilliant student I ever had in confirmation class was at First United Church of Christ in Cincinnati just a brilliant student. He won a full tuition scholarship plus expenses worth $120,000. And when he went to college, he came to a, the fullest realization he was gay and on numerous occasions tried to take his life because he felt alone and isolated. So the message I have is please find people who will love you, who are part of this community and a part of every community, if you look hard enough, don't give up. Don't take a road that is irreversible. Find your community. It's here. You can find it at PFLAG. You can find it at Fellowship Church. You can find it at All Souls. You can find it at so many places. Come to the diversity parade. March with us. Be with us. Um, don't be alone. So I don't know where the buckle is. I choose to think that it's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I'm sure that there are many people across this country that will argue with me on that position. <laughs>